looks like everybody's here, including Rahu. Hello. Um, now that we're all happy after a very good lunch, let's keep talking about the com um, commercialization of space and look at India's commercialization drive. Um, so we have Rahul Narayan from Team Indus. We have um, Lakshmis from um, Larson and, and Tubro. And then um, Lakshmi Narayan from the University of Texas, Prati Basu from uh, Satshur, and then we also have um, Ashok, who's a partner at Factum Law. So since we have a robust connection at the moment with Rahul, why don't you go ahead and start with your um, presentation? Can we get him to Skype first? Just to be sure we talk to him before we might accidentally lose him. Can you see us? Hi, Nimishi, this is Rahul. Hello. Um, so we're ready for your presentation whenever you are. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this panel. <coughs> My apologies, I could not make it there today uh, due to a last minute exigency. Um, so it's a quick introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the founders of Team Indus. Uh, the company I founded a little over seven years ago. And we've been through uh, an interesting ride over the past few years. Yes, we can see it. Yep. To, 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 to spend their budgets and money in exploitation only after the risk has been reduced. So therefore, the opportunity for new space companies to, to go beyond Earth orbit, because Earth orbit is a relatively known ecosystem, to go beyond Earth orbit, do the risky things, prove the capability, demonstrate the capacity, and over a period of time, if you drive down the risk and drive down the cost, I, I, I truly believe 
that the governments will come in, the large budgets will come in, and this will become a very, very vibrant ecosystem on its own. Uh, so any of you who are not familiar with Team Indus, a quick background. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we started off uh, just about seven years ago. We, we started off as a Google Lunar X Prize team. We won $1 million of that landing milestone prize. We were the first team out of 30 starting teams to be reviewed by the judges in October of 2017. Uh, we hopefully still are first in line to be the first privately funded mission to land on the moon. We do plan to fly multiple times to the moon over the next five years and in the process driving down the cost of doing business beyond our orbit. So, so that's the that's target that we're setting ourselves up for uh, beyond uh, the competition that we were participating in. So very quickly, one quick snapshot on what we are building at Team Indus. So uh, what you see on the left-hand side of your screen is the qualification model of our spacecraft. So this was subjected to qualification loads, the launch vehicle. Uh, it was a fully uh, integrated model uh, for, for propulsion, for uh, structures, mechanisms, uh, electronics, and so on and so forth. On the right-hand side, you see our exploration platform, that's the rover that we're building, uh, ICA. Uh, ICA is about seven kgs of mass, all aluminum, uh, four independently driven wheels, uh, and has autonomous navigation capability. What you see on the bottom right over there uh, is a snapshot of our mission operations center, uh, wired and geared up to be able to manage or control the spacecraft when it is in flight. So just a little background on what we have been doing till now. Why do we think that the Earth-Moon ecosystem is going to see a lot more activity in the coming five years? So uh, it's a Delta V chart. I'm not sure you can see this very clearly, but, but from low Earth orbit within a band of one to two kilometers per second of Delta V and two to five kilometers per second of Delta V, there is a lot that can be accomplished. And these are Delta V numbers which are relatively achievable. The problem of getting to low Earth orbit, the problem statement of doing stuff in low Earth orbit, I, I think uh, if you're starting off now, that's you entering a very cluttered field and not, not a great area to be playing in because there are established players, there are up and coming players, and that's, that's a business um, vertical, that's, that's, that's an industry vertical is, which is very, very um, you know, uh, heavily populated at this moment. Uh, different kinds of players uh, playing in different avenues. We, we do believe that the rest of the ecosystem is open. So if you go beyond low Earth orbit, you start looking at geo and beyond. You start looking at the Lagrange points of the moon, lunar orbit and lunar surface. There's a lot more that can be done, and it can be done using relatively smaller delta V numbers. So that's 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 our projection or prediction, and that's that's the market that we're looking to work towards. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've, you've all seen and heard uh, about, you know, how, how, how would space play out? So, so, so our hypothesis, and again, this is deriving from what we hear in the markets, what we hear from the industry and from uh, folks out there, is that space today is, is used as a medium. So space is a medium. We bounce signals off it. We send stuff which comes back. We take photographs from it and, and, and send it back to Earth. So space today continues to be used as a medium. Space is yet to be used as a destination. And, and, and once we start using it as a destination, uh, we will have to start using it as a resource as well. So our prediction uh, for, for the Earth-Moon ecosystem over the next five to seven years by 2025 is we believe there are going to be a bunch of exploration platforms. We believe there are going to be a bunch of demonstration platforms, which are going to go out there, deliver payloads, do science, send data back, and do it repeatedly. So, so that that to to us is the first phase or the first wave of what is going to happen in the Earth Moon ecosystem. The second part of it is when we start making it a destination. So a destination means a, some kind of a permanent. Um, base or a permanent habitation which need not necessarily have humans in it and and obviously that that's going to take beyond 2025 and by 2030 we believe uh, a lot many different agencies and countries would would have would have done something to create some kind of a permanent um, permanent installation in in, in space uh, beyond the international space station so um, much larger landers 
uh, sample return missions, uh, we believe you can expect a whole lot of those by 2030. Beyond 2030 is when it gets interesting because that's the prediction for when space would be used as a resource. So whether it is fuel depots, whether it is communication relays, uh, whether it is maintenance depots, all of that is something that we see coming up in a permanent capacity, in a multilateral capacity beyond 2030. So, so some projections to where we see uh, this industry or how we see this industry evolve over the next seven to, 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 to 12 years uh, time frame. I, and, and you know, with space, we're all used to very large numbers. So nothing new, I'm sure all of you have heard and it's probably been said uh, here at this conference itself, which is space on its own is gonna be more than a trillion dollars by 2040. And this today it's, 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 it's approaching $400 billion by a natural growth rate of six to 7% over year on year. It'll ex far exceed a trillion dollars by 2040. Uh, our projection is that if deep space or beyond Earth orbit is even a couple of percentage of that, we're still looking at a very, very large number as a market size when it comes to um, beyond Earth orbit. So to answer the question which every startup has or every, 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 every investor who's looking to invest in space has, uh, who's going to be paying for this? We believe there is going to be new, new players and new money coming into it. So what you see on the right-hand side are our new constituencies. Obviously, the biggest, the most powerful is the outer ring, which you see government agencies or space agencies being able to fund large programs like the ISS, large programs like Lunar Base, and so on and so forth. But but the new kind of money that we anticipate is is media companies, and we've seen uh, Japan demonstrate that we we ourselves were are in discussions with multiple media companies to see how could space be exploited for the new kind of content that can be created there. The second constituency are engineering companies themselves. So uh, it's our industry is characterized by cooperation. Uh, we see ourselves working very closely with, with folks who eventually over the next five to seven years will, will build capability, which is very similar to ours. But until, until that point in time, we see ourselves uh, feeding off each other and learn from each other as we go forward. So, so there, is, there is new intent, uh, and, and the intent obviously is to be able to, uh, to build a sustainable ecosystem uh, with private public private partnership and if that happens then there is this, this is going to be a very 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 vibrant economy to be part of so that's 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 uh, to us it's a very very encouraging sign um moving on and then coming close to ending my presentation here so we see ourselves uh, we see ourselves as an, a, you know the recommendation is if this is not sustainable and it's going to be run like a race then it's not going to it's not. It's going to run. Not going to run for too long. As part of sustainability, I think reliability and repeatability are very important parameters that that need to be addressed. It needs to come at a lower cost than what it costed previous space agencies to do it. And there has to be in situ resource utilization. Without having these four parameters addressed, I don't think it will be possible to have a sustainable uh, beyond Earth orbit kind of presence. Um, we, we all talk about public goods and public assets in a, in a national context, but, but when it comes to space, uh, public assets would have to be would have to come up in a multilateral context. So, so we're looking at at at, at, at being ourselves being able to contribute to, to, to some of those initiatives. Uh, Moon Village, Village Association is something that the Europeans have noted that's coming along very well. Luxembourg cluster is, is, is very interesting in in what they are trying to do as, as various private companies. Um, and so on and so forth. So as, as capacity, our prediction is there will be multi decaton orbiters, uh, there will be multi-ton landed payloads on the moon, and, and there will be multiple sites each year. Um, so what you saw in the first slide, it, it, it looks like at least two dozen missions to the moon over the next five to seven years. Our prediction is that number should at least double, if not go beyond that. So, so just a little bit of prediction of, of how we see beyond Earth orbit evolve. I promise that I'll back to, to government and, and what the government can do. Uh, and I'm aware of it through some of my conversations on, on what they're already working on. So uh, a vision document for us in India about, about what Vision 2030 looks like. I mean, not Vision 2022, uh, not 2025. I think Vision 2030 is important. I know certain countries have gone ahead and done Vision 2110, uh, which, is, which, is, which is just, you know, which, which is great to have, but 
what, what is more important is to have something which is actionable within the next decade. So Vision 2030 is important, and this is Vision 2030. If a version, Vision 2040 can be created, which builds on or assumes that within Vision 2030 will be accomplished, I think that would be a great step forward. Just a vision document, we have the skills, we have the resources, we have the we have the knowledge base within the country to put something like this together. And I think that would be a great, great step forward. Sustain long-term development. Uh, uh, with, uh, sustain long-term development in space requires long-term investment, and it cannot, uh, you know, change uh, with. Uh, so, so just like we've seen NASA over the last eight years follow a certain route, and now in the last year or so, it has picked up a different route and is now aiming for the moon. We're happy they're aiming for the moon. Seems like a sustainable target to go after. But then, uh, when we need to have a vision document, which is 12 to 15 years out. Uh, you need to have a plan and you need to have investment that, that works towards that vision. So that's, that would be the second requirement there. Um, I know ORF is about, about, is about the policy, and I think policy in India needs to very quickly address the framework, needs to address ownership, liability, uh, public-private uh, partnerships. I think that is very, very important to be addressed. And if the government could address that over the next year or so, uh, I, I think that is set in motion uh, 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 industry that will work uh, in conjunction with the government to ensure that Vision 2030 is realized. Um, so those, those are the big items. Obviously, the tactical items, and I've been a huge proponent of um, India coming up with their own version of SBIR, or the Small Business Innovation Fund, uh, or a DARPA, Equivalent. I think I think that's something that we lack. I'm I'm aware of, of colleagues, um, in in peers and colleagues in, in running space startups who have uh, who are frustrated with with having hit a roadblock because the usual VC cannot invest or would not invest in space startups. So uh, the need for 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 a, a DARPA equivalent fund I think is immense. The resources exist within the government. I think the will also exists. Somebody has to has to get up and say they're going to anchor it. So I think that's that's one huge tactical step that can happen. It's not going to take much. I, I believe the government already has a 10,000 crore uh, startup fund. If some of that could be earmarked towards space, I think that's, that we, we, I'm sure there are enough startups which will lap up those funds uh, very, very quickly. Um, education and incubation grants, I think, are, are already something that, that we've been talking about, but from a, from a tactical perspective, if somebody could get down to putting, putting targets uh, which are annual or, or you know, a two years in nature, I think that would be more helpful. Something that enumerates the targets as opposed to, you know, just giving a vision. So vision is already done uh, from a tactical perspective. Can, can somebody come down and say, we're going to disperse uh, 10 crores over the next two years, we're going to incubate 25 companies, and this is, this is the kind of objective. I think that's important to get into place. Syndicating capacity, and, and you know, uh, I heard a lot about this, and and, and I and I totally agree. Um, capacity, when 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 it comes up in disparate formats, whether it is it is it is something as simple as a frequency or something as simple as Earth imaging, the ability for an agency or an entity, which could could be Department of Space or could be a body in the Department of Space, to 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 add, to, to aggregate the, the demand for that would be great. Uh, to syndicate the capacity to, to the facilities when it comes to infrastructure is all available inside Department of Space. It's, it's available uh, with DRD. It's available, but but it's all disparate. It's all all over the place. And and I remember how we struggled to really find the right kind of a of a thermal vac chamber. I mean, I, a, a lot of simple things, if it came to a single window, would make would have made our lives easier back then. Uh, now we know the ecosystem, now we know who to reach out to, but it should be easier for any new company uh, trying to get into space, trying to build hardware. Uh, it should be easy for them to get to this kind of infrastructure to get under hand capacity. So that's it, brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, we believe Beyond Earth Orbit uh, is, is, is a big market waiting to happen. We believe uh, from India we can do a lot with that. Uh, and, and, and this is an invitation for anybody who wants to come collaborate with us uh, and, and be part of our strategy. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions if time permits. Thank you. 
All right, so since you are on remotely, maybe we'll take your questions first and then continue with the presentations. Um, those of us who work in space feel very at home right now. We've had lots of last minute changes and adjustments and we've used technology to get around it, so we've got him on Skype. Um, but with all the changes, I've made a mistake. And if this were NASA, I would charge each of you $10 million. But the, um, the issue is, um, I, I apologize, Ravi Kataria, I did not introduce you. I incorrectly said Lakbash is here. So um, we'll let you do your presentation after this. So um, Rahul, may I ask you just a couple questions before we open this up to the audience? Um, you came into the sure. space industry without being a space engineer or scientist. So um, if there's anybody here in the audience today who doesn't have a strictly engineering um, electronics or software background, for example, what advice would you give them to get, get their feet in the door? Can you hear me? All right, why don't we give a, them a couple minutes to figure that out? Should we just go on to the next presentation while you guys try to engage him? Oh, okay, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, um, so I wanted to ask a couple questions before we send this out to the audience. Sure. All right, so you came into this business without being a space engineer or scientist yourself. And for those who are in the audience today who similarly don't come from an engineering CS kind of a background, what kind of advice would you give them? If you want to do something audacious uh, in any industry, it's, it's always better to be an outsider. The example that I give is the way they teach swimming in NBA is that they throw you at the deep end. And uh, usually, if if you if you didn't know any better, you're probably gonna uh, you're probably gonna be able to pick up uh, bigger challenges in any given industry. So my advice is, uh, if you feel you have it in you, uh, go go meet advisors, go meet people who've done it before, and uh, you know, trust your instinct that a dedicated company team can deliver what, you know, large companies are not able to deliver. Okay. Um, so in terms of your future plans, I'm just wondering, companies like SpaceX like to do all of their development in-house. Um, are you going to continue to adopt a model like that, or are you going to either acquire startups yourselves or outsource your technology development as you move forward? Um, so... I mean, it, it, that, that's a function of scale. And SpaceX did a lot of stuff in-house, uh, quite like, I mean, I mean, it's the same philosophy that even the ISRO has, which is aluminum in and rocket out. Uh, but you do that when you reach a certain scale. Um, as, as startups, as smaller companies, I think you begin with as, as designers or system in, uh, integrators, system engineers, and then if you hit that scale, we, you would want to keep as many things as possible in-house. You move in-house for scale, you move in-house for controlling time, uh, quality, and cost. So uh, for teams in this itself, we, we do see ourselves as, as program owners and system designers and engineers. Uh, manufacturing will continue to be, today we have close to 30 Indian partners and about an equal number of international partners that we work with. So manufacturing, to my mind, will is a very expensive exercise. Uh, where possible, we would try and outsource it to, to peers and partners. Okay, so outsourcing where possible. Um, why don't we open this up to the floor for questions? Devanshu, do you want to grab a mic? Hello, Rahul. Uh, this is Devanshu from Rocketeers. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the uh, team industry could not uh, complete uh, uh, their participation or their uh, moonshot uh, within the uh, frame of Google Lunar X Prize uh, because, uh, as I said, that the contract with this row fell through uh, because. Uh, because of funding issues. So now uh, you guys are still trying to go ahead with your mission and you're trying to do it in uh, 2019. Uh, what I want to know is uh, what do you think would change uh, during this time period that would lead to you being able to fund the launch at that point of time? And also, do you plan to monetize the technologies that you have already built as a part of uh, building this mission in some way or the other? And if so, how? Uh, great, so many questions over there. So very quickly. Um, uh, we we consciously worked very closely with ISRO uh, when we closed the contract out, and that's something that we did uh, last month. Uh, we're looking to expand our capacity, and, and uh, what I spoke about in my presentation is it's it's not just about one moonshot. It's not about going there because we have, we could go there or because we want to show we could go there. It's about being able to do it sustainably. So the one big change in our strategy is we're not we're not chasing a prize anymore. We are looking to build this 
as 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 significant capability that we have. We can demonstrate that and also build out capacity. So um, our previous phase chart, we're looking to land about 20 odd kgs in the surface of the moon. The next version that we're working on right now would would land, uh, you know, three times that. So so that's that's the first increase in capacity. We believe we can continue increasing capacity over the next five years and therefore drive down the cost of access to moon. If we drive it down to a level. Uh, which starts reaching levels of what it takes to reach lower orbit, then I think it's a huge market that we are created not only for ourselves, uh, but for the global industry as such. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. One more question, I think. Yeah. Hi, Rahul, I'm Senjati and I'm a lawyer. So I have uh, three questions, but they're all interrelated. No. Um, Three more questions, okay. But they're all interrelated. I'll be quick. So uh, first of all, I just wanted to understand uh, that given the team in this on Indian soil has created such accomplishments, I was wondering what the legal impediments that you might have faced in doing that. Uh, second, that the draft uh, space bill that has come up, uh, do you have any quick comments on it? Like, is it serving your purpose with respect to my first question? In, in the sense of legal impediments. And the third is that uh, the entire debate on privatization and commercialization of space vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your uh, intellectual property rights. So uh, since you're getting funded by a huge private sector, do you think you face any problems or, um, I mean, yeah, problems only with respect to your trademarks or copyrights or patents? Thank you. Great, that will take quite some time to answer, but let me, let me try to answer this very quickly. Um, so, uh, in response to Bigushi's question, I did mention that, you know, uh, it, 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 it's tougher in a way when you're building, a, you know, creating your own path, but it's easier in another way that, you know, the, there are actually no, uh, no, no, no previous uh, things to follow. So, for us, it was relatively easy. What we were trying to do was, was unique. Uh, it hadn't been done out of India before. So in, in one way, it was tough. We had to discover new things. In another way, it was easy because uh, we were, uh, the contours of what was going to be developed was, were, 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 were the contours of our mission. So our mission created those contours. On the second point, which is the legal uh, aspect of it, I think, uh, I think there are certain laws which are already in place, and these laws reflect what they Outer Space Treaty, the UN Outer Space Treaty does or, or, or picks up from. So, so there is a certain understanding, but there is a certain gap also because these laws were drafted back in the 60s and 70s. So I, I would say a, a framework, framework exists. It's frustrating that it has not been updated to today's day and age. So that's, that, that's, that would be my concern over there. Uh, to your third point about uh, India's space law bill, I think I, I, th I think there's a lot that, that, that can be done uh, differently, and that's what I spoke about in my presentation, which is uh, we, we need to not look at it from the perspective of what we want today. We have to look at it from the perspective of what would the needs be in 2030 or 2040 when you start doing space tourism and you start sending people there and you start you know, uh, having things uh, having resources which are which which you can garner or, or gather in space. So, so my my comment to that, and and I have written uh, my feedback on that uh, to to the Department of Space is that I I, I think more can be done. Uh, this is a great start, but more can be done uh, so that we are future ready as opposed to looking backwards and only addressing what what has already happened. Um, third question: private investment. I think we still see ourselves as a technology player, as a product that we're building. And uh, uh, till date, we haven't faced uh, too many challenges uh, when it comes to investment. Uh, but there could be a few things that, that could be done differently by the, by the policy framework, which probably makes investment much easier or makes investment uh, more conducive because if you have a SBIR or a DARPA kind of a, a framework supporting it, and that framework is that for every private dollar that is invested in a particular initiative, a verified validated initiative, the government would match it or government would give 50% more. That's something which would be, which would make it very interesting and make this industry competitive on a global stage. So I hope I answered all your, all the points of your questions. Question. That was really good answering questions from a lawyer. Nice. We don't do that very often in this <laughs> business. 
All right, so I think we have Thank one more question. Um, we have one more question before you go. Um, is that okay? Is there, yeah, a, is there a mic? Can you please identify yourself too? Uh, Rahul, this is your old comrade in space, <laughs> Pallav Bagla, science editor, NDTV. <laughs> yes, sir, how are you doing? Boss, by now you should have landed on the moon. It's sad. <laughs> Uh, Chief, one quick question on the uh, space bill. Uh, there's one specific aspect which says that all intellectual property will belong to the government of India. I haven't heard you say anything about that because that seems to be uh, quite a sweeping taking over of rights by the government of India. Um, so you haven't seen me speak about many of many of the points over there. The other point that you missed was, um, and I'm sure you've not missed it. I'm sure nobody's missed that. A point which says that anybody who uses services of a space asset uh, has to report into to the government of India. So by by virtue of a space asset, all of you in this room have phones which have GPSs, and GPSs are all using space assets. So all of you will fall under the purview of that bill. So as I said, this bill right now probably looks at uh, what, what's happened till now, but you'll have to start looking at it from a you know, next 12 to 15, 20 year perspective as opposed to looking at it from today's perspective. So that's what I meant by saying more could be done by the bill without getting into specifics of that. Okay, thank you. Um, that's so too diplomatic. Yeah. I, I don't think you're gonna change <laughs> that law by I just stating that, you. Rahul. You have a big bear in the government of India. You guys can take this offline then and follow up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you want to stay on for the next 40 minutes. We have some other presentations. Um, if you stay on, you can answer more questions, or if you have to go, that's, that's fine too. Either way, up to you. So let's I, thank I'll stay on for a bit. Okay, great. Thank you. So yeah. let's thank Rahul again. So can we move on to the next presentation, please? And by the way, while we're doing that, when I said I wanted $10 million from you guys, nobody left. That was supposed to be a joke. Would have given me enough to go to an asteroid. Okay, now I'm getting some laughs. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so this picture is also supposed to make you laugh. I Photoshopped that myself. Um, so we're just going to talk about the Indian commercialization drive, and I have a, just a couple slides for you to put this in context before we go on to the, uh, the speakers themselves. Um, can you forward it? I'm not sure where the clicker is. Oh, found it. Great. Okay, so um, New Space India, I had mentioned they were on the order of 15 companies that um, are out there doing stuff in, in space tech. You can see some of their logos are here. And what I'm hoping is that this is just the beginning, and I may have missed some, some of you. If I have, definitely come and let me know. Um, the community has a database. It's just a spreadsheet at this point. We're hoping to go on to make it into a website. And we would love to be able to add you in. So definitely let us know. Um, as we indicated earlier, education seems to be the biggest um, sector, but we're sort of spread across the board and in all these different areas. And um, we have a number of um, people from these teams here, I think that's kind of awesome. So if you want to find anybody on the break and, and ask more about the, their work, if they're not presenting up here already, um, please feel free to do so. And so um, in terms of what we're talking about here in this spe specific session, um, we wanted to address the various Earth ISRO initiatives involving private industry and the challenges that arise from these initiatives. We also want to look at the new initiatives to build a viable space industry in India and what steps are required to promote entrepreneurship in space services. What is the scope and nature of, future, of the future private space industry? And will India liberalize satellite launch and manufacturing indep indep independently enabling, um, sorry, enabling independent development? So um, there's the context. That's what the speakers were generally asked to address. So um, can we move on to the next speaker? And that's Ravi. Uh, good afternoon, one and all. 
Firstly, I'd like to, like to thank ORF and Dr. Raji in particular uh, for inviting LNT and me here to share our perspective. Over the period of last, uh, I mean, last two days and today, we have had various uh, spotlight speakers or eminent speakers. So like yesterday, we had uh, Professor Chandrasekhar and Dr. Suresh from ISRO, who said that capacities need to increase multifold. He spoke something like five to seven times they need to increase. Today, our guru here, Dr. Pillai, I don't think he's here now, but in the morning, he said, uh, he told us what are the things to come in the next 100 years. All this requires capacity ramp up both by the lead space actors as well as by the downstream space actors. And so to say the manufacturing industry to where we belong to. So I'd like to try to, I'll try to give you a perspective of the manufacturing industry on its readiness on this ramp up journey. Uh, we are all aware about uh, ISRO's journey which has been from self-reliance to global prominence. We know about uh, ISRO's achievements, be it uh, multi uh, many um, large number of satellites or largest number of satellites in a single launch or placing multiple satellites in different orbits in a single launch, they have done it all. But more importantly, what they have done is, the key ingredient of their success, which I believe, is they have nurtured, seeded nurtured the Indian manufacturing industry be it the public sector undertakings, the private industries, the SMEs, and the MSMEs, for all. And today, the industry is already doing various aggregates and services uh, for ISRO. Today, the industry is realizing, um, uh, is involved in the realization of space systems such as launch vehicles, spacecrafts, uh, doing also the uh, satellite, uh, satellites as well as the ground support systems and other facilities and services that the industry provides to various ISRO centers all across India. So the industry works here today includes essentially parts, subsystems, modules, subassemblies, and to an extent certain systems as well. So this association has been uh, there right from uh, the SLV days to the present uh, PSLV and the GSLVs and the GSLV Mark III days. So they've involved the industry, uh, the manufacturing industry at large uh, in all the, in building all the aggregates which they outsource to the industry. So today we can say, this is the view of uh, Larson and Tubro that Industry has achieved, uh, you know, self-reliance in terms of materials as well as the mechanical systems. Uh, the industry has, to a larger extent, mastered the various processes involved, be it in terms of materials, uh, processes, fabrication, heat treatment, welding, machining, etc., and is also getting uh, and is also doing assembly and testing. And today the industry is capable of providing full systems to ISRO, which I'll show you in subsequent slides. Now from here on, I have few slides about my company, LNT, not because I wanted to show only that, but because we cannot show slides or are not privy to slides of other companies. So there are many other companies also who are involved in this, apart from Larson and Tubro. So we have a dedicated aerospace machining facility at our uh, Mumbai uh, premises, where we do the rocket motor casings for the solid uh, uh, solid stage of the PSLV or the stage one of the PSLV. We have a pressure proof test facility there as well and heat treatment facilities as well. Uh, we have all the manufacturing facilities in terms of welding, drilling, machining, heat treatment, everything. We have yet another manufacturing facility in Coimbatore, which is a precision machining and fabrication facility, AS9100 certified and NADCAP certified. And here we do all kinds of welding, forming, heat treatment, surface treatment and testing, precisely focusing on aerospace and aviation requirements. We have precision machining facility, all three axis, four axis and five axis machines in terms of what are machines that are listed there. And we do our own tool design, we manufacture our own tools and we focus on metallic aerostructures. And we have all the inspection and the test setup means, also the environmental uh, setup means as well. We also have advanced composites manufacturing facility at Baroda. 
which is also an AS9106 certified facility, and it has all the requisite infrastructure in terms of dust-free enclosures, curing ovens, autoclaves, uh, clean rooms, uh, material storage facilities. And we work on various technologies right from uh, manual hand layup to high-end composite technologies like resin transfer molding, vacuum assisted resin transfer molding, uh, tape winding, and various other things. And this facility also is AS9100 certified as well as NATCAP certified. Today the industry is also uh, capable of processing all kinds of exotic alloys, be it titanium, titanium as well as its alloys. We are also doing various machining for various titanium alloys in terms of high-speed machining, critical five-axis machining, and doing various uh, subsystems uh, which require very close tolerances and various thin wall structures. We also do various property, uh, physical property enhancement uh, processes. Uh, it could be to improve the machinability, to improve the strength, or even the extrinsic property enhancement like it could be something like surface finish or even the physical uh, look of the items. The industry is working on various other uh, ISRO programs which uh, Dr. Pillai and yesterday Dr. Suresh uh, emphasized. This is one slide where I wanted to tell you the experience of Indian industry. Now, we are, LNT as a company is doing the propulsion system for another missile, which is the Akash uh, surface to air missile for the uh, Indian Armed Forces. We are doing the propulsion section. We struggled initially for doing one propulsion system a month because one propulsion system requires to source subsystems or components from 112 different suppliers, all SMEs and MSMEs put together. And then we supply the entire thing to the integrator. So we took it upon ourselves so certain things we manufactured in-house, though it did not make business sense, but in, uh, with a view to uh, move on with the program, we did this, took it on our own, and today I can say we are doing more than 35 to 40 systems a month, and this is far more than the requirement. So in space also, when tomorrow there is a huge requirement coming up as we are uh, looking at launches going on of PSLV from four a year to eight a year to 10 a year or even some, some places they talk about 12 and 18 a year. So I think the industry is fully geared up to that. The value add that the manufacturing industry brings is in terms of the automation that we bring in, uh, be it in terms of automation or even uh, introduction of uh, robots for enhancing the uh, production rates. We are doing various uh, critical uh, items, the deck panels where the payloads sit, the heat shields and the payload fairings. LNT is also involved in doing the 32 meter dish antenna, which is a deep space network antenna installed at Bangalore. We've also built an entire radar in C and S band. From a single page specifications, we have built the entire radar, which was used for the moon mission and it continues to be used by ISRO centers. Industry is also involved in doing various uh, critical mechanisms. Now this, for example, is a solar array deployment mechanism, which is uh, required to store the solar panels during launch and they have to function only once in its lifetime, uh, once they are up in space and it cannot fail at that time. So they're so critical. And these have all been done by the private industry right from uh, the earlier satellite launches. Similarly, the reflector deployment mechanisms as well. We've also been doing various ground systems, such as the plate stretcher for stretching the aluminum plates which are required for stress relieving for aerospace application. And this is a very, uh, I should say, a complex multiple system of systems uh, which uh, the industry has realized for ISRO. It is a hypersonic wind tunnel which is multiple system of systems, and ISRO is only, India is only the third country in the world to have a hypersonic wind tunnel of uh, this capacity. And we were the prime contractors for this in doing this on an entire turnkey solution basis, right from design to installation. This is from MAC 6 to MAC 12. So what Dr. Pillai told us, the things, uh, 
the scheme of things to come, everything will be hypersonic and so on. So the industry is ready for this. Now if I have to sum up, if we see the future of space technology, it is going for low, there's requirement of low cost access to space, reusable launch vehicles, high throughput satellites, large observatories, smaller satellites, quantum communication. What does it mean for ISRO or the space agency? So the imperatives for ISRO are faster realization of launch vehicles, spacecrafts and satellites and payloads. Meet the industry expectations of a proper business case. More importantly, to productionize the launch vehicles and satellites to the industry now that they have been proven and productionized. So that ISRO's resources, intellectual resources are free for doing the things that are being seen today for the next 100 years for the next generation. What does this translate for the Indian manufacturing industry? What we need is not only reliability, but we need repeated reliability. We don't need one launch on the moon. We need repeated successful launches. We don't need one PSLV launch by the industry, but successful time, of time and again. We need stringent process control. And in space, people say there's a huge investment. It is because unlike the automotive and other industries, here, it is not uh, quality control by sampling. It is 100% quality control, so which provides you know, a lot of work uh, and effort to go into quality. Synchronizing flow for scale up, each time right, doing everything each time right, because uh, there are no uh, chances you can take in these kind of missions. Risk taking while protecting our IPRs and uh, uh, space uh, main space access IPRs, and more importantly, being cost competitive. Now, these imperatives also throw up certain opportunities for the industry. So there are technologies to be developed in terms of additive manufacturing, robotics, composite materials, which today we lack in India, friction, new technologies in welding like friction steel welding, and advanced surface treatment. And also capabilities for assembly integration, and more importantly, scaling up. Not doing it once, but doing it every time. Uh, Dr. Pillai started with this quote, but I would like to end with this quote, emphasizing that we are second to none when it comes to exporting advanced technologies. Thank you. Thank you to ORF for inviting me to be here. Uh, this is my first time uh, at this conference. And in particular, thank you to Raji for being a great host. Uh, let me, let me uh, actually give you some perspectives that, uh, that I have on the, on the on launch vehicle and propulsion uh, industry as, a, as it ba basically relates to the new space or space 2.0. Uh, so I'm going to actually present some material here that is slightly contrarian to what <laughs> much of this community believes and, and, and is, is, very, is very enthusiastic about. So just, just be aware <laughs> that, that I'm going to take a perspective that's a little bit more uh, you know, realistic. So with that, that note, I will start off. So what is new space, to new space or space 2.0? So obviously, there's renewed interest in space as an enabler for economic growth, human progress, and so on. Uh, what is important about new space? or space 2.0 is also is driven by private interest, right? So basically there's private companies uh, versus government or uh, as big space as Bidushi uh, talked about earlier. You know, it is, it is new space is different from big space because it is a private, private industry that motivates it and drives it. So obviously commercial fall profit enterprises are, are, are going to play a key role. So there are obviously a thousand startups at least over. So, and, and I think from, from what I heard from Bidushi, it is a thousand five hundred startups worldwide most of them are in the US and in other Western spacefaring nations. And as we know, uh, there's a handful in India, 15 to be, to be more precise, that we know of. 
Uh, New Space presents an ideal opportunity for India to exploit. Uh, so basically, this is actually part of a high-tech domain that demands strong engineering and scientific talent, uh, which we have abundant, uh, abundant uh, you know, talent in, uh, in, 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 in India, obviously. So we all, uh, India also has a strong legacy in this domain. So ISRO, the defense, in, you know, the defense basically government entities have, have played a very large role in, in pushing, this, pushing this forward. So before I actually move on, I, like, I, I want to just sort of step back a little bit and just say a few things that, that basically everybody knows, anybody who has been involved in any commercial kind of enterprise knows this. Uh, any, any commercial enterprise has to have certain salient features. I mean, they have to, you, have to have, you have to know what the opportunity, opportunity is. Right? So you have to identify pain points that are there, inefficiencies that are there in the system. And if you have, to have the wherewithal, you have to be you know, motivated to create a new feature. And so there are some companies that have done that, right? created a new feature. Solutions. So if there are these opportunities, obviously there are going to be solutions that these commercial entities are going to perform, uh, are going to exploit. So basically, we don't need to develop a viable solution. And the question is, you know, is the solution feasible within with the resources and the timeline? So that is another question that is very important to address you know, as far as the commercial entity is concerned. Timelines. How long will it take to develop these solutions? Uh, how long will these uh, solutions take? It takes. What time will it? Uh, what time will it take to go to market with these solutions, with the final product, and time to revenue? So it's not just important to just go to market, but basically you know, you need to realize the revenue. So at the end of the day, you need to keep your eye on the ball. Right? So you need to generate revenue from this. Cost. Who pays for it? Right? And what will it cost? So is it debt, equity, bootstrapping? So ideally, you know, you want to bootstrap if it is possible. So these are some questions that come up, you know, typically. And we have to basically put this whole new space, commercial enterprises in entering new space in this context, and I think that is very important. Okay, so before, uh, again, I move on to talking about new space itself, let us, let us sort of step back again a little bit and talk, look at some recent successes and re recent failures uh, you know, that, that we have witnessed, that at least I have witnessed you know, for almost firsthand. So I will talk about something that I, I was actually part of, and, I, and that is the perspective which, I, which I'm coming into this new space uh, you know, business in. Uh, I was actually part of the Solar 2.0, you know, through some activities that I, that I, had, I had worked on. And Solar 2.0 is very similar to Space 2.0, New Space or Space 2.0. So Solar 2.0 is basically, essentially start, the starting point was somewhere in the 2005 time frame. And the opportunity was this. There was need for renewable energy, need for you know, large scale renewable energy into the, into the power, power generation mix. And and, and obviously th that was motivated by problems with fossil fuels, you know, environmental degradation, you know, have we reached peak oil, you know, is it going to start, fall going to start falling off, is the cost going to increase and so on. So that was the opportunity. Solution, focus on te developing technologies and manufacturing approaches for high efficiency solar cells at grid parity. And grid parity was, was, was pretty stringent here. We're talking about less than a watt, or less than a dollar per watt. And the solutions involved, you know, really advanced thin film solar cells CIGS, copper indium gallium disulfide, uh, cadmium telluride, multi-junction films and uh, multi-junction cells and so on. So there's a whole host of solutions that were that were actually proposed. Uh, the technologies for actually realizing these are al already exist, but the real key was how do you manufacture them at grid parity, right? Less than a dollar per watt. And another interesting twist came up with this uh, with this solar 2.0, you know, quote unquote revolution, and that was functionalization of solar cells. So the, the vision was that you could actually functionalize solar cells onto things that you do use every day. So one, one of them was basically rooftop, so, rooftop tiles integrated with solar. So you could go to a store, or if you are a construction company, you could go to, a, you know, you could go and basically buy tiles, rooftop tiles, that actually have solar cells embedded in them. So it, it not just served as rooftop, rooftop tiles, but also served as you know, power generation. Uh, you know, uh, it also served to generate power. So it was great. I mean, lot, lots of large government subsidies were involved uh, for, for basically kickstarting this domain, uh, solar, both in the solar power generation, large scale solar power generation domain, as well as solar for home. Over 100 US Silicon Valley startups you know, that, 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 that were, were actually came up in this as part of this revolution. And I believe it has to be no less than $10 billion in venture that went into this. Uh, some, of this some of the features of this, of this, uh, of this uh, was basically the, it obviously involved long, long gestation periods. So developing technology, manufacturing technologies for things like this, you know, with this kind of grid parity involved long gestation time. So we're talking about at least five years to 10 years, you know, in that time frame before you can actually realize the product. 
large investments were involved, right? So we, we already said that basically more than $10 billion, and probably a lot more than that, that number went into, went, into, went into this. So suddenly there was one, one new actor that came into the picture when this, when this happened, and that was China. China smelled an opportunity. Number of Chinese startups entered the fray, but basically almost all of these Chinese startups you know, did not invest in high tech. In fact, what they did was took low tech, crystal and silicon, manufactured it at below cost, below market cost, and obviously it was subsidized by the government, and essentially this was dumped in the, in the US market at significantly below, below market values. In fact, dumped to the point where this grid parity value is today you know, about 50 cents per watt or lower. Right? So that, that is a problem. There was no hope for these new startups to actually achieve that kind of value and number. So it, is, it, it became a big problem for, the, for, for, for this. So what happened? The market for US companies was almost destroyed, completely destroyed right, by, this, by this event. Almost all US solar companies that started up during this time frame, 2005 and onwards, are today bankrupt. You know, they're all closed down. The, the few that survive are actually companies that actually existed before this revolution, this solar 2.0 you know, happened. So there's a clear lesson here. So clearly there was an opportunity. Viable approaches were being developed. There was financing was there, but there was no mechanism to prevent what I call malicious players in the market. So this is something that you have to be, you have to be, very, be very cautious about. Okay, that was, a, that was a failure story. Now, obviously, in the US, there are many success stories too, right? The whole internet revolution and so on, I will not go into that. Let's look at one success story from India, right? So IT industry in India. So this approximately started in the 90s, early 90s. The opportunity was obviously very clear, the high labor costs in the West. So it's clearly a labor cost play here. So the solution was the skilled labor cost in India, uh, skilled labor in India, but you know, obviously available at low cost. So routine of, of office tasks can be back office and low-end software engineering tasks can be outsourced. Time to market was zero. Basically, all you needed was a few good guys, you know, sitting in a room and typing away, and uh, you know, and, and you had it. Right? So financing all close to zero, right? You could bootstrap. So basically, what I came out of this was India invents the 24-hour software and back-office delivery model. So in fact, this is actually a, a testament to, to, to re really something that came out of here. So no government played no role. So uh, I, I believe on the first day there was one, one of the panelists who mentioned that really the Department of IT <laughs> was initiated after much after the, the, the you know the IT industry in India became very mature. We don't have that. By the way, we don't have that situation right now with with the space industry. And obviously there are no there was no opportunity for a malicious player to to play a role here. I mean there's no, no nothing that could be stolen, nothing that could be you know that 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 could be fouled. So you know it was great. So opportunity was exploited successfully. There was generation of large scale employment in India, generation of national wealth, and we are all, you know, in a sense, reaping benefits, benefits of that. So Indian companies <laughs> since have moved up the value chain to where they are now delivering design and engineering solutions, you know, pretty high end design and engineering solutions. So really, this is truly a success story that we, 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 we have, you know, to look back at. So coming back to space 2.0, and I'll actually take a, a perspective with, with launch vehicles and propulsions, because that is so, it's something that I know of uh, more than I do you know, with satellites. And things that I'm going to talk about here are not necessarily true for satellites. You know, it might, it, 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 the, 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 the whole um, equation might be very different with that. Okay, I'll, I'll be done. <laughs> launch vehicles are the first step in any space mission. Often launch vehicles are the only vi visible part of the mission, so it, it, it actually great, makes great news or media coverage. Opportunity is the launch is actually typically 50% of mission cost. So if you can do something about launch, you can actually make a big impact on, 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 on the overall mission cost. Even in satellite propellant, so if you just take satellite propellant, not even the launch, the satellite propellant typically is 50% of the payload. So anything that you can do to bring this down can actually have a large exponential effect on the total, total cost. So solution, so we have a great business case to be made for, uh, for, for coming up with solutions to cut cost, improve reliability, and frequency of launch. Okay, so having said that, let's look at number of launches per year. So basically, started off with this, 150 launches per year worldwide, right? So we're talking about everybody launching into orbit. It came down through, through this period, and finally where we are is 90 launches last year. Next year, there is, which is this year, actually 2018, we are, we are looking at maybe 200 launches, maybe less than that, actually, in reality. So it is not that many. We are not talking about launching huge number of, we are not talking about launching at, with a, on a very large scale, it's actually still very small. So the question is, how many launches in the future, and when does that future arrive? You know, so we ought to get to 
hundreds of launches, right? let's say 2,000 launches or, or 5,000 launches, you know, when, does that going to, when is that going to happen? You know, how far are we from that? So the business case is with the advent of power, powerful uh, micro and nanosat technologies, space will be democratized, meaning that we can make small satellites that do many useful things. So a large number of play private players will participate, huge increase in the number of private and government space assets. So clearly, if this can take off, take off you know, because of this, if this can take off, then the launch industry is going to see, you know, a really, really a, 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 a big push. So now, what is the response to this opportunity? So 90 launches, remember, 90 launches, 2017, no more than 200 launches, 2018. So what is the response? We have more than 30 companies that are exclusively focused on launch at this time. Right? So to me, it sounds a little bit excessive. Uh, Let's look at the biggest player in that, you know, that is SpaceX. So we'll actually do a little bit of a deep dive into seeing what they can do. So obviously there are other, other big players like Blue Origin, Rocket Labs, and so on. Some of these are actually people that, that find a lot of press, but there are others that don't find, see much press here. So SpaceX as a case study. So early business case was motivated by gap in the launch capacity for small satellites, so, so Falcon 1 and Falcon 5. So remember, today SpaceX is, is launching the biggest launch vehicle, but basically they started off launching small, small launches. You know? They were focused only on the small nano, microsat, nanosat kind of market. And somewhere along the, along the line, basically, they started talking about colonized Mars. I, I actually fail to understand why that happened, I, I, although I have a theory why, why they're talking about it. So the, sometime, not to, not, not to, maybe about five years ago or six years ago, they, they, they did a pivot in their, in their business. They pivoted to basically targeting traditional payload, uh, payload launch. So they, and this, was, this coincided with the NASA retiring the space, the space shuttle. It was basically too, too expensive, and with the, with the problems that they had with failures, you know, they, they actually created a poor, poor optics. In fact, the Kalpana Chawla, Chawla Conference is, 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 is basically the name, name that comes, comes from some of, these, some of these events that happened here. So re resupply missions to the space, space station, uh, commercial launch by incumbents uh, were too expensive, in fact, continue to be too expensive, at least 200 million. You know, in excess of 400 billion, 400 million per launch. I mean, that's basically where the incumbents are charging for per launch. And what is SpaceX charging? About 60 million per launch, and Falcon Heavy is about 90 million per launch. I mean, that's the, that you can go to their website, and that's what they tell you. So this is what their value proposition is: cheap compared to what the incumbents are doing. And in, in fact, they're talking about making it cheaper. So how are they going to make it cheaper? Cost reduction through mass production. Uh, so in fact, we saw a, a presentation yesterday by Dr. Suresh who talked about. The same concept that even ISRO is using. So basically take a Merlin engine. In fact, just take that one engine, a simple, essentially a, I mean it's complex technology, but, but in a sense, it is proven technology, right? We are talking about something that is 50-year-old proven technology. Putting nine of them, creating the Falcon 9 rocket system, and then basically putting three of those Falcon 9 rocket systems and creating the Falcon Heavy. So you, you are using all the, all the nice time-proven mass production approaches, and the same approaches that basically underwrote the Industrial Revolution, you are basically bringing to bear to to, the, to quote unquote, you know, the, the, the launch industry. So that has been great. Uh, another cost reduction approach has been reusability, right? And they claim that they can actually, uh, as a result of reusability, the cost can come down from 62 million for Falcon 9 to about 30 million and maybe even less. There are several articles that are in the literature that have attempted to analyze the true cost, uh, you know, for example, one of these, but there is no clear cons consensus. So some of these numbers don't appear right. So for example, SpaceX has 5,000 employees. If you take the full-time equivalent cost of an employee in the US, it is $200,000 per year. I mean, that's not, what, that's not what they are paid, but basically that's what it costs to employ somebody in the US, $200,000 a year. Multiply that by 5,000, that's a billion dollars per year. So at 62 million per launch, you need 16 launches just to cover salaries. Okay, so that is a very important takeaway. And at $30 million per launch, you need about 30 launches per year to, to actually just cover salaries. We're not talking about everything else. In fact, all the other things are going to be much more expensive. SpaceX did 18 launches in 2017, and close to 30 launches they are proposing to do, to do in 2018. I do not know how they're actually covering these costs. In fact, obviously they're not profitable. Obviously they're not making a profit, although they claim they're making about 40% you know, profit. So actual cost launch, who, who knows? I mean, we, we don't know, nobody knows. So SpaceX, in fact, may never make a profit in their launch business. Instead, if you read the literature, they actually talk about uh, relying on other lines of business to scale and profitability, example, satellite internet. Right? So clearly the launch industry by the biggest player, the biggest gorilla in the room, right, is actually not a vi very viable solution. So opportunity, there exists opportunity for low cost launch to support democratization, privatization of space. 
solution. Unclear that there are any low cost solutions today, and that's my, my opinion. Perhaps we should just accept that launch is expensive business <coughs> today and for the near future. Let's just accept it, I think that is basically important. Uh, timeline, scale in launch, thousands of launches per year, that is basically when you start seeing the scales where you can bring down the cost. We're not come for a decade. So what is the situation with the startups today? If you're talking about a decade or two decades, before which you can actually see scale in the launch business, what is going to happen to startups today? Who's going to keep funding them for 10, 10, 10 years or 20 years? You know, that, is, that is something that we have, be, we have to be cautious about. So what is the opportunity now? Back, back to the, so we are, I, I believe we have to be back, go back to the drawing board and look for options. So air to orbit is one option. In-flight mass addition, that's something that Dr. Pillay talked about today. So these are different kinds of launch technologies that are not doing the same thing that, 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 has, that, has been, that was done, in fact, 100 years ago, right? No, no, not even 50 years ago. So as far as India is concerned, uh, ISRO will continue to be the key player in the, in the foreseeable future. Launch propulsion companies will need to hitch their wagons to ISRO. I'm, I'm talking about the Indian launch companies, which is very, very important. I think you do not want to lose, lose sight of that. Uh, they, are, they are the big players in the room, and they will continue to be the big players, and you need to basically hitch your mission to their mission. I think that is very important. Government will need to play an active role in helping incubate, protect, and create opportunities for Indian startups in the launch propulsion domain. At the same time, government creates opportunities, must, government should also demand, when I say government, I'm talking about ISRO, should also demand results and performance that are comparable to industry standards. Otherwise, you know, you just can't be in a situation where you're doling out money <coughs> that Rahul talked about, I mean, you're, you're giving out money to the industry, helping them, but basically not demanding something out of them. This is going to be another gravy train if we actually let this go that way. Right? So we want to prevent that from happening. So with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm still waiting for my slides to begin. I'm Pratip Basu, and uh, um, I am from Satshare. I'm founder of Satshare, which is a startup. Uh, I won't say whether it's a new space startup or something else. Um, well, I have, this is the fourth edition of ORF, and uh, I'm glad Raji keeps inviting me all the time. <laughs> so uh, just to uh, get, get started with the agenda, Okay, so just to get started with the agenda, um, we are there are three, uh, four things. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, you have it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, I have ten minutes, so I'll try to finish that in ten minutes itself. Uh, a brief overview of the space industry, uh, what's causing the commercialization drive. Uh, what are the par policy paradoxes that we often uh, come across? And um, finally, what we as a company do and navigate across those uh, po uh, policy frameworks. So quick look into the uh, space industry perspective. Uh, as the global space industry, uh, the commercial space industry's uh, uh, overview is, 60% or more is usually from the downstream activities of satellite applications. And usually about, uh, between 20 to 30 would be around from manufacturing. Uh, what you see in that uh, slide, uh, some of the Indian incumbents uh, uh, who are uh, in the manufacturing space, right from HAL, LNT, uh, Midani, who, are the, who have traditionally supported the Indian uh, uh, space program and continue supporting it, while there are some new actors who have uh, come on board Team in the Spellatrix Aerospace. In the manufacturing side, uh, I have cheekily put uh, my company logo there on the application side. And uh, uh, the launching part, which uh, Dr. Uh, Lakshmi Narana was speaking about, yes, there's only one king there, which is Antrix. And just to uh, give a perspective here, the reason I put a Mars picture is because just like Mars is a tiny speck in the solar system, our uh, commercial space uh, revenues from uh, India is also a tiny speck uh, of about 200 million or so when compared to the global uh, space industry uh, revenues, which is somewhere around 350 billion as per SIA reports. So what is very important to understand is uh, we should not be looking at space industry in uh, silos. When I say silos, um, why are we just speaking of uh, you know, just the upstream part of the space? It's a huge industry value chain. 
right from the rocket manufacturing, satellite building to ground stations, and the applications that you uh, create from the space infrastructure. So just think about it a parallel. Um, GPS, G the GPS signal, they were open for civilians in early 90s, right? But it took this, a smartphone, in 2008 to actually you know, uh, start uh, using it by a huge number of people. So what was happening till then? There was not a marriage of the platform use cases and the technology. So whenever you look at any business in the downstream uh, space, uh, this is probably the first thing you should look at with who is going to buy it, who is going to pay for it, okay? So uh, that's where uh, uh, we see uh, you know, complementary technology like smartphones who, which has contributed to a lot of the small sad growth, if I can say that. Uh, then you have the IoT story which has been building up and trust me, without satellites, the IoT story is incomplete. So satellites are the biggest generator of uh, data from space and it will continue to drive the IoT industry, both in comms as well as uh, imaging side. And finally, the advent of cloud computing, AI, big data, all the uh, you know, jargons that we keep uh, listening to, it's very important for us to think of space data as a value creator in the uh, other industry ecosystems. Just for example, uh, from San Francisco to uh, New York, a six hour flight, it generates 11 terabytes of data, 7,000 sensors. Every, every half a second, you, it generates uh, some data points. How are you going to uh, make sense of that data? And what value uh, would it create if you start making sense of that data? So these, these questions keep hitting us all the time. And uh, that's where we'll look at what are the technological convergences happening. While in India, uh, there are certain uh, factors which is driving the commercialization uh, of space. And uh, to begin with, uh, young people in this uh, room wearing cool ties are, are one, you know, this, it's an aspirational generation. We are uh, looking at uh, uh, you know, figures like Elon Musk, who, if, if you haven't yet heard, put a sports car in deep space. So <laughs> this is definitely a very good time to be a space entrepreneur. Um, while we also have uh, you know, a very large number of uh, uh, skilled STEM graduates, which is reflected nowadays in American soaps like Big Bang Theory, except the bad accent. And uh, <laughs> also, when we look at uh, uh, one of the major things that has changed over time um, is the outreach that ISRO has received. When I was growing up in a small town, no one knew about ISRO. I had to explain to them that I was joining this organization which sends those satellites from which you see your uh, TV, Kyuki, Sasbi, Kabi, Bahuti type of serials. So uh, no, with the Chandrayaan mission and uh, Mangalyan mission, uh, ISRO is a toast of media and it has actually created a lot of uh, you know, uh, outreach uh, and especially among young people. And uh, one interesting thing that has not percolated in India at least is the lower entry barriers. So you have companies like uh, Berlin Space Technologies and Planet Labs who have uh, really uh, brought together uh, uh, innovations in manufacturing uh, and uh, you know, bootstrapping and even raising money uh, to an extent that uh, it has completely changed uh, how we look at space industry as a high cost, high uh, you know, uh, timeline based business. But um, we still in India, uh, we have some, some issues uh, and it's not always policy related. Uh, a lot of, lot of people come and say, we need government support, we need uh, money. Uh, you show at least some, some uh, prototype, you put in your some little money and do something unless you show value to the government. Why would the gov government you know, put public money for private risk? So uh, that's, that's something which inhibits us. There is not enough investor uh, um, education, uh, if I must say, uh, about what, how the businesses actually work. So, those are the local global factors driving commercialization. But the biggest factor which is and will continue driving commercialization is the government. The government has, uh, has been a driver for creating applications out of the space infrastructure. Ever since uh, uh, the new government, I shouldn't say new, it's three years old, but ever since the uh, BJP government came here, they have released memos after memos to ISRO Currently, NRSC is sitting on some 126 projects. They don't have the capacity to deliver those, and they are of real national importance, whether it comes from agriculture domain or defense, or infrastructure, comms, and 
this is where you need to have not just policy frameworks for you know going to other planets and asteroids, but also understanding how the uh, you know different domains are impacted uh, by space data and understanding the proliferation of that data across different industry value chains, which is where we come to something which has been discussed over the last two days quite a lot, policy. I'm not an expert on policy, but uh, from a layman terms, uh, that green nice pipeline is the new space uh, activities bill. Uh, and uh, what, as an entrepreneur, I see are the timelines, 2000, 2011, 2017. A lot of things have changed in those uh, years. You know, In six years, uh, we went from uh, the Symbian phone to a proper uh, you know, fast iPhone. <laughs> but uh, policies somehow, they don't uh, change uh, th that rapidly. But as Rahul uh, from Team Indus uh, pointed out, the National Space Activity Bill, uh, which is definitely a decent effort by DOS uh, to you know, put together a framework so that companies like us can survive and uh, play legally uh, in the country, uh, was, is so broadly worded <laughs> that Uber in India will become a space company. Uh, then you have the communications uh, conundrum where uh, there are so many stakeholders, you need 23 licenses to get a, a broadcast, uh, you know, uh, uh, ch uh, license. Someone from uh, a propulsion company was asked, telling me that he has a lot of challenges, four different uh, uh, you know, departments, nine licenses, They're like, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> you know, this, it's, it's, it's weird. But uh, what also uh, is uh, necessary to understand that, uh, um, Everything cannot be under the same, uh, under a master policy document. S something like uh, insurance or telecommunication, which is not under the purview of uh, Department of Space, but uses space data, that should be annexures or addendums to the space bill and then covered under the respective policies and not be encompassed under a single uh, umbrella. So uh, that is where we definitely need to uh, advocate, uh, educate, sit with the government and uh, you know uh, do, because sitting, just discussing it ourselves doesn't make things work. So briefly, what we do, why am I speaking so much of jargons? Because I'm also a small key holder in this ecosystem. Uh, I'm just missing one blockchain icon and we would have been a total rainbow company. But uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the thing we do. Uh, create insights by uh, leveraging uh, different sensor technology and uh, all the uh, scaling using big data uh, frameworks. Our uh, competencies in machine learning, and when I say our, it's not mine, I'm a propulsion engineer. <laughs> but uh, this is the reason we started doing this is because we were driven by the real life applications that space technology brings. And this is a very basic framework of how uh, we provide uh, solutions. Uh, this is from the agri perspective where uh, we are combining different data sets, satellite data, weather data, economic data, you know, profile data, which we don't have, the government has, and I'll come to that, how we accept it. We create products, products that have, that from where you can create repeatable services, from where uh, you can reduce the cost of access to that data, and also uh, create solutions that are actually adding value. If it's not you know, uh, you know, attacking a pain point of your customer, why would they pay for it? Starting with just two, three examples I'll provide. Rural credit. So a lot of people know India has like 1.4 billion people. 55% of them are farmers. How many millions does it make? 750 approximately or something, right? Um, two minutes? Yeah, I'll finish. <laughs> so uh, of the 750 million people, uh, only 10 million people, uh, 10 million farmers are uh, covered uh, by uh, public banks, with the large banks and uh, somewhere around 270 million are covered by the rural cooperative banks, which leaves like about 80% of farmers without access to institutional credit. Now, by using satellite image data, because it has a rich history, and combining that with land cadastral records, we have been creating assets for the, for the banks uh, so that not only they can monitor the risk assets better, but also start creating alternative credit risk uh, data. They don't have credit ratings for farmers who have never used uh, ATM cards for transactions, only gold and land, that's it. So that is a real life use case because access to credit in a timely manner actually makes uh, the farmer's life easier. Speaking of insurance, crop insurance. 
while we have grown up, like I have technically grown up inside Israel. I'm a uh, graduate of IAST from the first batch. Uh, we uh, read nice books, uh, you know, touching lives and all. But uh, <laughs> it's very interesting to see that uh, in 2018 also, uh, the effect of satellite data is not felt. As per the new insurance scheme, there, is, uh, there are 10 million crop cutting experiments where people go to the ground, cut the crop in a five by five meter plot, and uh, then say what is the uh, yield of that uh, entire region for a particular crop. It is not only a stupid method to do it, but also very laborious. You don't find enough people, and each crop cutting experiment costs $20. Multiply that by 10 million uh, crop cutting experiments, you have a num good number, amount of cost that the government uh, incurs. By using simple satellite-based analysis of grading the uh, regions remotely in the, uh, by, by terms of yield, we were able to introduce a bias in the sampling and reduce the cost. It's already 50% reduced. The target is 20% of the original cost. And that is reflected in the insurance premium that farmer pays, which means it's a penetration driver. Last but not the least, facial governance. Uh, this is very, uh, it looks colorful, but uh, <laughs> essentially it's a time series clustering, a proper data science approach of uh, not looking at regions as per agroclimatic zones, but uh, looking at them from how the pixel by pixel uh, correlations are and creating your own zones. So how this has helped uh, people, government and insurance companies, understanding the crop risk variation spatially, and also, uh, you know, uh, not, uh, putting cert farmers in certain region at a disadvantage. So <laughs> what essentially happens is if you work with the government uh, in gray area is like what we do, where satellite data uh, and other uh, financial data, everything comes, uh, you start shaping policies with them. You add value to them, they add value to you, and uh, essentially you create an industry. And uh, uh, just to put a parting perspective, we should not forget, India is a technically a socialist state. So <laughs> whenever we bring some ideas, it should have some uh, public good uh, kind of uh, uh, inference. And uh, we, sh we are always looking to work with the government, uh, because if we want to do something, uh, they are the key stakeholders, as uh, Dr. Lakshminara and had put. Thank you so much uh, for your rapt attention. And sorry, Bidushi, for overshooting by a minute. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am painfully aware that as the last speaker, I'll be more interesting if I speak less. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I'm a partner with Factum Law. I am primarily work with a lot of space startups in the country. Uh, my focus in this presentation is going to be to assess the role of law and how it can impact and affect uh, commercialization drives in the sector. Uh, it's very important to understand how law and policy actually has a correlation with investments, right? Because uh, the predictability of uh, what, what is a recognized form of investment by a particular country, uh, what is the uh, transaction cost associated with that uh, investment, how much am I going to get taxed, what is going to be the system of protection for my investments, what is the cost of enforcement, uh, everything is shared by policy. So policy is uh, one of the essential drivers of investments. Last but not the least, it is also a key to address dispute resolutions within investments. If investments don't go right, you'd refer to the law to see how, how best you can seek redress here. So in the context of space, just to give a little bit of background, before we came and made this presentation, we did a systematic mapping of a whole range of applicable laws. Uh, first and foremost, we assessed international investment law. Uh, we mapped the domestic space policies of about 10 countries, both in the developed and the developing world. Uh, the Excel sheet containing the synopsis is with me. I'll be happy to share it. And we also studied arbitral awards arising out of investment disputes. And we finally assessed how all of those actually play in the context of uh, domestic space policy and investments. So in the context of law governing investments, you first have, and space policy, you have first the international uh, rules and regulations. They cover the standards of conduct, issues pertaining to militarization, appropriation of outer space objects, uh, which in turn uh, define the way national domestic legislations are formulated. Therefore, legislations often reflect international instruments. 
And the combination of the international and domestic policy in turn affects contractual relationships. One, contracts with the state and contract between non-state actors. What if, uh, how much of freedom do I have to enter into these contracts and how easy it is to enforce it? So in terms of assessing India's space and non-space policies, I think there are three areas that we look at. So this goes back to the first point of how an investment-friendly policy must be predictable. For an investment-friendly policy to be predictable, it needs to have three things. One is it must have clarity in terms of the policy intent of the relevant state. It must be non-arbitrary because those are standards that are prescribed by bilateral investment treaties. And in the context of India, it's also within Article 14 of the Constitution. And then there are also the contractual relationships. How much does the policy permit freedom of commerce, freedom of contract, and how easy it is to enforce contracts? So let's look at the space activities bill, right? I think a lot is being said about how vague it is. But I think it's very important to realize that the bill by itself is not complete. What we are also awaiting is the regulations and the rules that will actually come in the wake of the bill, which will help us understand what is the scope of the definition of space activity, because the machinery for implementing the bill itself has not come out yet, right? But here are the areas where I think we need to have a, a serious relook at the bill. One is a time-bound application process for all upstream and downstream space activities. Netherlands and Belgium, when we did the assessment, actually defines a time limit within which all applications for uh, space activities will be cleared. So the bill does not yet look at an approach of time-bound application processes. Uh, taxing of space commerce. It's important to remember that under the domestic spa, uh, sales, uh, sales tax regimes, Transactions in high seas don't uh, come under the scope of domestic sales taxes because they're considered out of the border of the region. So what if a satellite in space is sold? How will that be addressed from the point of view of policy? This will again define what the transaction cost of an investment is. And largely and the most importantly, the exercise of discretion given to administrative authorities. What will be the uh, attitude, what will be the approach to interpreting the discretion given to them? Because that in turn has to comply with the standards of treatment under bilateral investment treaties and under Article 14 of the Constitution. For BITs, I cite the arbitration in Devas, and for Article 14, I cite the cancellation of 2G licenses. Let's look at it from the point of view of whether the uh, proposed legislation and the policy environment is reasonable, right? First is the conflict of interest of decision makers, which is, a, which is one of the key concerns that I have frequently understood from the industry. If the operator in a particular market environment also decides to regulate the very same market environment, it raises legitimate concerns among the competitors as to whether or not they can actually function within that market environment. Intellectual property ownership, somebody raised the point about how all IP generated in space belongs to the government under the proposed bill. To my mind, that fundamentally conflicts with the spirit and letter of other intellectual property documents, because there, if I am the inventor, I am the first owner, and if I have an assignment, then the assignee becomes the owner. So the space activities bill must fundamentally revisit that, because to my mind, the, the standards of treatment required for businesses don't get adequately met with that kind of uh, approach. How much do treaty obligations get reflected in the space activities bill? A phenomenal clarity in terms of standards of conduct in space, but one of the key things to remember is international obligation does not just mean the outer space treaty. It also means international investment law obligations, and I think that perspective needs to come into the bill. Lastly, on the subject of offenses, you will see that there is a punishment prescribed for things like pollution in space. But a lot of these punitive provisions don't have any emphasis on the intent to pollute, which means that even if there is accidental debris, will that result in criminal prosecution? And can a judicial magistrate first class who is used to trying check bounds cases suddenly have the capacity to also prosecute cases involving space debris? So these are some questions that I think the proposed space activities bill really needs to address. Contractual difficulties, so this gets very interesting. So first is the enforcement of contracts, and India's ranking does not reflect very well there. We rank 164 in the ease of enforcement of contract index. Uh, to put it in perspective, Iraq, which has gone through political turmoil, is actually 20 places ahead of us. Uh, it takes much lesser time to enforce a contract at a fraction of the cost. So I think India has to do much more work in terms of raising the enforcement of contract uh, you know, issue in the country. 
Uh, to this end, Commercial Courts Act have come into the picture. Delhi High Court recently notified wonderful civil litigation rules, which actually expedite the process of civil suits. So I think we are getting there. But freedom of commerce and contractual relationships, so that, that's where things get interesting. Uh, if anybody is familiar with the uh, concept of the TDSAT, which is the adjudicating body for telecom disputes, there was a judgment uh, rendered in the case of Headends in the Sky Technology, which more or less said that a content aggregator has to provide to a hits operator the content at the same price as they provide to, say, DTH or cable operators. So essentially, it was a big question mark on the freedom of contract and commerce in the country, because now suddenly the courts are telling us what our contract should look like, and I don't have the freedom to negotiate prices with different customers. Price discrimination as a co concept comes to an end, right? So how will that be looked at by investors? I'm assuming not very well. Uh, similarly, uh, on the subject of contracts with the state, we saw in the case of the 2G spectrum issue that while licenses were issued by the state through license agreements, ultimately the Supreme Court exercising jurisdiction under Article 14 of the Constitution actually canceled 2G spectrum licenses which essentially led to arbitral proceedings being initiated against India for bilateral investment treaty violations. So I think there is a big issue there that we'll have to fundamentally relook at and ensure that these uh, points pertaining to BITs and, in, and investment obligations are brought into domestic policies. Last but not the least, even in terms of contracts between non-state actors, we see in the context of transponder leasing that the state has a central role as both a negotiator as well as an approver of relationships. So which means that if one fine day the government decides not to give a no objection to a certain transaction, then the entire business plan for that particular year gets affected. So I think the proposed space activities bill as it matures must address all these key issues in the form of the rules that it will come out with. And last but not least, uh, having reviewed some agreements for space startups, uh, in terms of just being able to define the barriers of entry, I think a lot of times contractual conditions don't reflect market realities. It's nice to say get insurance if you want to launch, but where is the ecosystem for launch insurance? So I think uh, what is needed is not just a singular approach or a siloed approach to reviewing the space activities bill, but what is actually needed is a comprehensive review of the policy ecosystem, which covers not just the space activities bill, but everything that affects it. Evolving laws for evolving challenges. So India had something called as the judgment uh, that affirmed the right of privacy. Now this particular image can actually tell me uh, you know, what is the, the intended yield of crop for that particular year. I can get the name of the owner through publicly available land records, and I can put two and two together and determine what is the creditworthiness of the farmer that owns the land. Right? So uh, now how will uh, privacy be addressed through the remote sensing policies? So as long as we don't evolve policies at a very quick pace, I think we will always fall one step behind. So this is just one example. But what about uh, manufacturing in space? Uh, you know, we hear of kind of, you know, fiber optic cables being manufactured much better in outer space than in, in the country. How will that be regulated? How will, what will govern the transactions come up with, with those entities? So to conclude my presentation, uh, first and foremost, in terms of achieving clarity, we need to introduce investment law perspectives into the policy ecosystem. Uh, we need to have clarity on transfer of technology and access to facilities for space actors. We need sector-specific regulations for emerging issues. If the policy tries to do too much, it will do too little. We need to have very, very niche and very, very specialized approaches to policy for uh, emerging space activities. In terms of reasonableness, we need to review the penal provisions in the Space Activities Bill, introduce the requirement of assessing mens rea or criminal intent. We need to review IP ownership, and we need to ensure that we honor bilateral investment treaty standards so that we don't get pulled up in arbitration before permanent court of arbitration. Contractual, we need, uh, we need to ensure that we preserve the freedom of commerce. We need to create the capacity for enforcement, faster enforcement, lesser cost, and good judgments at the end of it. These are the citations. I'll be happy to share any of these materials with all of you. Thank you. All right, thank you to our speakers. We got some great content there. Um, I know we are standing between everybody and their tea and coffee. So do we have time for a couple questions? Okay, seven minutes. So let me just quickly provide a summary of what we've heard. Um, so Rahul talked about space being a medium today, not a destination. He thinks we're heading in the direction of it being a destination. 
Ravi discussed how um, industry and uh, has to share industry work share with the government has been critical, and that industry will continue to play a role as we um, scale up in government projects. And Lakshmi Narayan talked about um, a general observation that I thought was very interesting and relevant to new space, which was that um, stealth players will come in and do the unexpected, although I think there's a difference between um, the solar um, cell industry, which is unskilled workers, and IT, which requires um, workers with a higher level of skill. So maybe space tech will similarly be protected. And Pratib talked about um, the value of combining space and land-based data to provide um, higher level important products. And then Ashok talked about how space uh, policy should be investment friendly and the need to consider the space activities bill um, in the context of a comprehensive review of the entire uh, ecosystem. So is there anybody who'd like to ask a question? Yes, I guess Divanshu. LNT uh, building uh, propulsion systems for the Akash missile. Uh, so I wanted to know was the R&D and design for these propulsion systems done by LNT? And also uh, is the propellant manufacturing and curing done by LNT or are these just casings of the system and the propellant themselves, uh, the propellant itself is manufactured uh, by the government itself? Coming to your first question, uh, this R&D is done by the DRDO, it is not done by the private industry, not even by the public sector manufacturing unit which is current right now. Coming to the second part, it was uh, for the rocket motor system and not the propellant part, but that propellant part is not being done by the private industry today, not for lack of capability, but for lack of efforts. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I will be addressing that in the next panel. Okay. All right, anybody else? Yes. Hi, Ravi. This is Gagan from Manisar. Uh, just a quick question on your uh, assessment of the return on investment on if you go further into the commercialization drive. Say with the PSLV, um, could you give us some outlook on the kind of numbers needed from ISRO, the length of investment period you're looking at, the kind of collaboration you're looking at because you are uh, good with mechanical systems, but you will need electrical players and you will need engine players with you. So what is the gamut of opportunity you're looking at here? See, first of all, today, what the private industry is doing today is building subsystems and systems, not the entire launch vehicle per se today. Okay? So from that point of view today, the private industry's role is limited as of now. And going forward, as uh, Dr. Suresh and Dr. Pillai said, they would involve the uh, state uh, downstream actors also into productionization and launch services going forward. So presently we, are, we would look at at least a horizon of at least a decade and look at about uh, the number of launches would be decided by ISRO and the uh, uh, other requirements. But definitely at today's levels of four to five a year or this year it was seven are something on which the return on investment just, uh, just would not work out. You would need at least 12 to 15 launches a year to do it on a sustainable basis and to talk of some commercialization in the space. Thank you. Um, another leading question was that, would you go in with a consortium approach? Would you like to be the system integrator or would you still like to play as a tier one player? Uh, it is for the ISR and the Department of Space at last to decide the mode in which the industry would work in. Uh, it is not the choice of the industry per se. Uh, which list we could uh, play a larger role. Thank you. All right, so if you have further questions, which I'm sure you do, let's continue at the tea and coffee break. So, and let us thank our speakers again. <laughs>